So here we go. I want to talk about the individual uh, risk model. So with the individual risk model, we're going to look at the aggregate loss that is resulting from a fixed sum of independent, but not necessarily identically distributed random variables. So you see there uh, the general notation for the aggregate loss in the individual risk model is uh, brought together by summing the x1, x2 up to xn. And now the n is a fixed number. So in our previous setting, where we were looking at the collective risk model, the n was written with a capital, was a random variable. So we were summing there either over the number of losses or the number of payments. Whereas now, now we're working with a fixed number of contracts and we aggregate the losses across all these contracts. Right? So the usual interpretation is that we look at a sum of the losses from N insurance contracts and this uh, individual risk model, historically, it's really coming from the life, side, uh, the life insurance uh, side where we would study uh, random variables X, say, where we would say, okay, you have a life insurance contract and the X is going to represent the loss or the claim amount that the insurance company has to pay uh, on, a, uh, on a specific life insurance contract. So what matters then is the probability of death. Uh, so the probability of death within a certain year. Uh, within a certain year, so that means that we're looking at the aggregate loss over these end life insurance contracts uh, over a specific time horizon, for instance, a time horizon of a single year. So let's indicate the probability of that with uh, QJ. So that is the probability that a certain loss amount will have to be paid by the life insurance company over the next year uh, um, with respect to contract uh, J, right? And as a first step, we're going to assume that the insured amount is a fixed benefit. So the fixed benefit in our example here for death of person J is denoted with PJ. So in that case, the distribution of uh, the loss for policy J or for contract J, and I do note that I, um, I, I must say that I wrote this a little bit um, in an odd way, let's say, but, but it's, it's correct. Huh? So it says the loss X is equal to zero, with probability one minus QJ and the loss X is equal to BJ if uh, with a probability QJ, right? And then this uh, individual risk model that was typically used to get grip on what would be the aggregate distribution S over the considered time horizon, in this case, the horizon of a single year for these N independent life insurance contracts. Do note that their distributions, the distributions of those X's is not identical and they each have their own probability of uh, that denoted with QJ, right? So it's not a common uh, distribution that we're assuming here. So let us first reflect upon this particular setting and let's then take one extra step and generalize the aggregate uh, loss setting in the individual risk model. And do you have any idea at which point we could bring in the generalization? So what would you consider here as perhaps a bit limited? If you look at the, at the loss amount, which is denoted here with a small bj, so we assume it's fixed, which does make sense in a life insurance setting. Huh? The, the insured capital can be a fixed uh, amount. It's perfectly possible, but we can generalize the whole uh, individual risk, risk model by allowing the BJ to be random as well, right? So that's the next step that we're going to do in, um, in, this, um, in this discussion, okay? So that being said, um, first on this slide, we've got some yeah, rather simple manipulations. So let me guide you uh, through those by using the sheets. So first of all, you can ask yourself, yeah, under the given assumptions from the previous sheet, what is then the mean of the aggregate loss? So the mean of S, that's the sum of the mean of each of the XJs. Now the XJ, you know, it's a Bernoulli random variable. Uh, so it takes the value zero with a probability one minus QJ and a variable, and it takes a value BJ with probability QJ, right? So what is the expected value of this XJ? It is then the BJ multiplied with the QJ. 
right? So I should not say that the xj is a Bernoulli variable, that's not correct. I should say the xj is following a discrete distribution, right, with only possible two outcomes are zero and the bj, right? So its expected value is bj multiplied with the probability that this loss will occur, and that is the probability of death for this contract j. If we look at the variance of s, we can work with the sum of the variances of the xj because of the independence assumption that is made in the individual risk model. And then it's a nice exercise for you not to figure out that the variance of xj can be given by the expression that you see over here. And the way to do that, the way to check that, is by looking at what is the second moment of xj, so what is the expected value of xj squared. Figure that out, that's not too difficult because xj is following a discrete distribution with only two possible outcomes. And then, do, then you can do the expected value of xj squared minus the expected value of xj, which we already have over here, to the power of two, right? So figure that out yourself. This gives me the expected value of s, gives me the variance of s. We want to wonder a bit more about yeah, what, is the, um, what is the distribution or um, yeah, what's the distribution of s? How can we, can we work with that? And one of the first uh, steps that we could do is we could think about what is the probability generating function of the aggregate loss expressed by the random variable s, right? So by now we know it's the expected value of z to the power s, s is the sum of the xj's, they're all uh, independent, right? So we can write that as the product over j of the probability generating function of xj evaluated in z. And if we wonder about this xj, once again, it's a discrete random variable, it can only take two possible outcomes, zero and bj. So we know how to write down the uh, probability generating function of the xj evaluated. See, that's this case. Okay, so that being said, it gives us a couple of instruments that we can think, uh, that we can use when thinking about the aggregate loss in this individual risk model in this very simple setting where the probability of, uh, of, of payment is given by this uh, qj and where the loss is considered fixed. That was this small bj that we indicated. All right. So what we're now going to do is we're going to do uh, one step extra. So we're going to generalize this setting underneath the individual risk model. And we're going to look now at a random variable xj that is constructed as follows. So we do ij, an indicator variable, and we multiply it with bj, where this bj is a random severity that is expressed here for contract j. And we're going to assume now that we have independence among those uh, indicator variables uh, and those bj's. But we also have independence uh, within the indicator variables within the set of severity random variables, right? So there is an independence assumption all over this construction. So the ij is an indicator that is 1 with a probability qj, that is 0 with a probability 1 minus qj. So it's going to express whether we encounter a loss or not, right? So you could say that the indicator variable indicates whether the j policy is leading to a loss, is leading to a payment, depending on uh, the, the, the difference loss versus payment that depends on whether you allow the bj to take a value of zero or not. And then our random variable G, bj can take any distribution, uh, which makes sense for the kind of severities that we intend here to model. So it represents the amount of the payment of policy j, given that a payment was made. Yeah? So in the way how I formulate the setting here, I'm assuming that the bj is going to take values strictly larger than zero. So in that case, I'm working on a, a payment basis and then the ij is going to express the probability that policy j is producing a payment. So things are now a little bit more complicated and I want to take a moment huh, to work with you through uh, the derivation of, for example, what does the expected value become now, what does the variance become, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I suggest we switch to the iPad just to get some grip on, uh, on this. So meanwhile, if uh, you have a question, uh, do not hesitate to drop it in the chat. 
So here we go. Um, let us start from saying, okay, my xj, how was it defined? Once again, it's an indicated variable times a severity random variable bj. We're going to look at the aggregate loss, which is the sum over a fixed number of contracts, fixed number of contracts indicated with, with small n, and I'm summing this x1 up to xn. So the first question I want to solve is what is the moment generating function of s evaluated in t? So I know how to get started with that. I know it's going to lead me due to independence to the expected value of the product over j of e to the power t times xj, right? And if I fill in the expression that I have for my xj, then I'm going to use these guys, right? So that's my starting point for the calculation of the moment generating function, right? I've got an independence assumption, which I want to use over here. So that lead, leads me to the expected value of the product is the product over j over all contracts of the expected value of e to the power t times my Bernoulli times my severity random variable. And so the only thing that is left for me now is to calculate this expected value, right? And how would you approach this? Any ideas? Any uh, any terms that, that you should say, okay, that's that's what we're going to use here. That's the property that we would like to think about. The law of total expectation, yes, very good. Or the tower rule for expected values. That would be the same kind of reasoning over here. And um, it means here that I'm going to condition on my um, on my indicated variable on my x on my i j. Right, so I'm going to note it's the expected value of the thing I've been working with, given that ij is taking a value of zero times the probability that ij is equal to zero plus the expected value of this guy, conditioning on the fact that ij is taking a value equal to one times the probability that ij is equal to one. Right. So what I'm doing here is, yeah, the tower rule, I would call it. So you could say that the expected value of x is the expected value of the expected value of x given y, right, in general. And I'm using that here by conditioning on this uh, indicator random variable. And if I would do that, then the first expected value here becomes an expected value over d distribution of my indicator variable. And of course, the indicator variable can only take two possible values, either zero or one. So that being said, um, if we look at the expression that we, that we can use right now, huh? so what do, we, what do we see then? That if you condition on the indicator variable taking the value of zero, then you're going to plug in that value over here. So you have e to the power zero. So that's going to be value one, right? So you've got here one times the probability that ij is equal to zero, plus then the expected value of e to the power t times beta j, multiplied with the probability that ij is equal to one. Now we know what those probabilities are because we have some assumptions about these. So that's one minus qj, and this one is equal to qj, right? So if you look at it, you finally, you uh, end up with an expression for my moment generating function that is given as such. So it is one minus qj plus qj times the moment generating function of bj evaluated in t. So that's what I get. And I want to keep that in, in mind huh? because that turns out to be useful uh, later on in my uh, in, in today's session. I could do one last step and there I could say, well, it's in fact the probability generating function of the random variable ij evaluated in the moment generating function of bj evaluated in t. That's what I'm working with. Yeah. So keep an eye on this uh, result. This is something 
we will need uh, later on in today's session. So this is an important one, which we derived using the independence assumption using the tau rule for expected value. Okay, so what we're now going to do is we're going to think a bit more about uh, the expected value of S and the variance of S under the individual risk model with the given assumptions, right? And the reason why we want to do that is because, uh, think about some of the techniques that we've used uh, before. If you can match the moments of S with the moments of, for example, a normal distribution or a gamma distribution or something, then at least you can build an approximation for your aggregate loss uh, by relying on one of those uh, very familiar distributions uh, for which you match them the moments with the moments of the true aggregate loss random variable uh, S, right? So in order to do that, you need to get grip on what are these moments. So first of all, we're going to think about the mean of S. So the mean of S is then the sum over J, the expected value of XJ. So that's going to be the sum over J of the expected value of the indicator multiplied with the severity random variable. Now you can do exactly the same trick as before. Now you can do the, the tower rule uh, once again. So you condition as follows. And you could say, mm, so, um, right, so we can write this guy. And because of the independence between the bj and the indicator variable, this whole thing reduces to the sum over j. And then taking um, the indicator uh, random variable, yeah, together with expected value of bj and then of course if you're calculating the expected value over the indicator variable the uh, the thing that you've got over here acts like a constant so then we're left with the expected value of ij multiplied with the expected value of bj we know what the expected value of the indicator random variable is that's the probability of that and for the expected value of, of the, the loss, the severity random variable, we're just going to assume that it's given by a certain mu j. So that being said, uh, we get grip on what is the mean of our aggregate loss, S, which is the sum of the xj's here over contracts 1 up to n under the given assumptions. Yeah. So that's how, um, I think I missed a bracket over here. That's how we're gonna approach it um, in terms of calculating the mean in this aggregate loss setting. We're gonna do the same for the variance. So first make sure that we grasp all the steps that I made over here. Any questions on these? Anything that's not clear? So Petrian asks, how do you go from the third that's number three, to step number four, right? So Petrian, if I get you well, it's from this step to this step, right? Yes. So here I condition on the ij, but I know that the b and the indicator variable are assumed to be independent. So if I look at the distribution of b, if I condition on the indicator, uh, that doesn't matter because the two are independent. Huh? So that reduces to looking at the marginal distribution of, of the bj. And so I simply have to use here the expected value of the bj. And that's why I, so I simply can ignore the conditioning because b and i are independent random variables. And I can just work, continue with the expected value. Of the I'm going to do the same for the second moment now and then bring it together to the variance of S. So if I look at the second moment, let me then focus on the expected value of xj squared. So the operations are now very, very similar. Huh? So we're again doing the tower rule. 
So we condition on the indicator variable. Now we look at xj squared. So that is the indicator variable squared times bj squared. We condition on the indicator variable. We're going to do a similar thing as before. So that is the following. So remember the question that uh, Petrian just asked. We need to think about these, about this conditional expectation, but we know there is independence. So we can write this as ij squared times the expected value of bj squared. This guy becomes a constant when you're looking at calculating an expected value with respect to the indicator random variable. So this constant, you can put it up front if you want. So we're left with looking at this product. Yeah. What is the expected value of a squared Bernoulli variable? So what would this thing become? You can drop it in the chat. What should I write for this guy? Expected value of the indicator variable squared. QJ, thank you, Sebastian, very good. So we're left here with this QJ times the expected value of BJ squared, right? So that being said, I now have all the ingredients that I need in order to put the uh, variance, in order to put the variance together. And if I look at the variance then of XJ, I've got the expected value of XJ squared minus the expected value of XJ squared, both of which I just calculated. So that gives me QJ times expected value of the severity random variable squared minus QJ squared times this guy, right? And then it's just a matter of reordering the expressions. So I put a QJ in front. Um, what else am I going to do? I'm manipulating a little bit by bringing in this guy, by saying that's plus QJ times the expected value of BJ squared minus QJ squared times this one. So I brought in uh, this guy mul multiplied with the probability uh, QJ with a minus sign, and I added the same term over here, uh, just to make sure that I did not change my expression. So putting that all together, I can say that is QJ times the variance of BJ uh, plus then QJ. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to treat it like this. So that would be minus, um, no, I should do it differently. So I should put the part with the expected value bj squared up front, I should put a qj up front, and then I've got 1 minus the qj, right? So this gives me the variance for a single term, for a single contract, xj. And if I'm, for instance, denoting the variance of bj with sigma j squared, then I can put now by taking the sum uh, over the variances of all the independent xj's, I can get grip on what this variance for my aggregate loss would become in this individual risk model setting. So now I've got everything that I want to have. I started with formulating as the aggregate loss as the sum of those uh, xj's independent from each other, but not necessarily following the same distribution. And I derived the first moment of the aggregate loss s in that model, and I derived the variance of this S in this individual risk model. So now I've got uh, some powerful ingredients, which I can then use to think about yeah, how can I really um, work with the distribution of S. I'm going beyond first and second at the moment. So that's what we're going to do next. Any questions on, on this? So just take a moment to look at these derivations. Uh, there are applications huh, of tools that we've been uh, using before, um, but I think it's good to, to see these kind of steps um, once in the, in the course, right? So I'm going to return to the sheets. So we covered 
these steps with the iPad, using the iPad. So we're now arriving at sheet number 69 saying, yeah, how can we then calculate probabilities in the individual risk model? So you can go for exact calculations using convolutions, for example. And I understood that Eva brought uh, with her uh, an exercise on doing these convolutions yourself and just to uh, experience how difficult these, uh, this type of calculations quickly becomes. You can work with recursive formulas. We're part of uh, the work of Professor De Pril. And Professor De Pril was one of the main professors um, establishing the actuarial science group at the KU Leuven in, in the past. So he worked on, on deriving recursive formulas for the individual risk model. Uh, what else can we do? We can work with parametric approximations, or we can replace the individual risk model with a somehow similar collective risk model. So let's reflect a little bit on some of these uh, strategies. So what about these parametric approximations? So what we do then is we take a normal distribution Gamma distribution is sometimes used, sometimes used for a log normal. And we use this simple and well-known distribution to approximate uh, the distribution of the aggregate loss in the collective risk, in the individual risk model. And how do we do that? By matching the moments, right? So that's why we need it to understand how to come up with the mean of the S and with the variance of the S. So we have a couple of exercises on that in the tutorials where you're going to do that, that kind of, of approximation where you're going to build that yourself. On the other hand, we can also rely on using the compound Poisson model, which we studied for the collective risk model. We can use that here as an approximation to our individual risk model. So that's the last thing I want to point out. Huh? I want to give you a bit of flavor or, or, on how that would that would go. And first of all, why do we want to do that? Because we have a good tool to work with this compound Poisson distribution. We've got the Pagny recursion available for this compound Poisson distribution, right? So we want to use that and we want to use it as an approximation to our individual risk model. And this is what we're going to do. So uh, the, the calculation that you see here highlighted in blue, this is one of the things we did on the iPad together. So we realized that for the individual risk model, we can write the moment generating function evaluated in Z, we can write it as follows, right? And what we're going to do now is we're going to switch from the probability generating function of an, uh, of an indicator random variable IJ. We're going to approximate that somehow with, a, with the probability generating function of a Poisson random variable, right? So if you assume that the ij is Poisson distributed with a specific parameter lambda j, then you can switch uh, from the probability generating function of the Bernoulli here to the probability generating function of a Poisson. And then we, we, it turns out that we're back in one of the settings that we uh, studied earlier on, right? So how would you build this approximation? Well, you have to think then about how to calculate this parameter lambda j. You could say in a, in a simple, um, simple decision could be that you take the qj, uh, sorry, that you take the lambda j equal to the probability of success, the qj in your Bernoulli distribution, right? Or you could say, instead of putting an equality on the means, you could impose an equality on the probability of no loss in both models. And no loss in the Bernoulli model is happening with a probability 1 minus qj. No loss in the Poisson model is happening with a probability equal to the exponential of minus lambda j. We know that from the Poisson probability function. So that gives us an expression given the qj from which we can derive, we can uh, calculate the lambda j value. Right? So these are two common choices that can be made for choosing the parameter lambda j in our Poisson approximation. And now having this um, Poisson approximation, what we're then going to do is we're going to say, let's assume that the probability generating function of the random variable ij can be written as this. And what you recognize here is, of course, the Poisson probability generating function evaluated in z. Right? 
And once again, uh, we picked a meaningful value for this lambda j. So putting things together, the moment generating function of our um, uh, individual risk model S can then be written like this, right? Uh, but now you have to think back about what we learned in theorem 9.7, the analytic results that we build up over here, because it turns out that if you work out this product, that you can write it once again as the probability generating function of a certain Poisson distributed random variable, evaluated in the moment generating function of a certain random variable x, evaluated in z minus one. So that's exactly what we did in the theorem 9.7. We covered that in the previous lecture. Uh, so you recognize here then for the moment generating function of S, you recognize the structure from the uh, collective risk model. It's the probability generating function of a count random variable evaluated in the moment generating function of a severity random variable, right? That's the compound risk model. But we have here two specific choices. One for the count random variable, that's going to be a Poisson with a parameter lambda that is the sum of the lambda j's. And each of those lambda j's was chosen in a particular way and has a connection with this probability of, um, of resulting in, in a payment, uh, the probability qj from the individual risk model. And we have a particular severity distribution here. That is the distribution that corresponds to the following moment generating function. And we know what the connection is huh, between this moment generating function and uh, the PDF or the distribution of X. And that connection has to go like this. That's something we discussed when looking at the proof of theorem 9.7, right? So we've got something very interesting here. We end up with a compound risk model type of moment generating function. And then we can use the Pony recursion to get grip on the distribution of this S. Yeah? So this is a different type of approximation that you could build, but you're going to rely on the tools developed for the compound risk model. That's the message that I wanted to bring uh, over here. Questions on these? So that concludes our discussion of the individual risk model. Um, so it's I think it's useful that you have the formulation of this individual risk model uh, in mind, that you uh, have a good understanding on how to work with the mean and the variance of this uh, individual risk model, and that you can then propose some meaningful strategies to build uh, approximations for the distribution of the aggregate loss from the variable S in the individual risk model. Yeah.